Hey there, Slashaholics. Before I start tonight's narration, I just wanted to let you know that I am setting up in a new house and a new recording space, and there is a slight echo at the moment that I am working on getting fixed. I do apologize for that, and also I'm going to include the prologue in tonight's narration of chapters 1 and 2. It's been so long since I dropped the prologue for this book, I just wanted to make sure everybody that tunes in has the full story. So without further ado, here is tonight's narration of Jason Goes to Hell, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry, based on the screenplay by Adam Marcus and Jay Hewley. Prologue, Manhattan to Crystal Lake. They always ran from him, always tried to hide, and he always caught them. Sure, there had been a few over the years who eluded him or even managed to hurt him, but it would not be so for this girl. The girl with the fire for hair, this Rennie. He remembered her. She had escaped him once when she was much younger, long ago when the now dead old man had pushed her from the boat into the lake. He had chased her across the ocean, across the ripped, and torn bodies of her friends through this city of neon lights and down into this fetid, stinking darkness. He heard her gasping for breath ahead of him, heard her faltering footfalls echoing back to him from the sewer tunnel. She had grown tired after the chase while he went on and on as inevitable as the setting sun. It was almost over for her. There was nobody else coming to rescue her. The boyfriend lay unconscious in the tunnel behind them and the old man was stuck upside down in a barrel of slimy rainwater in an alley somewhere above. That's right, Jason, his mother spoke in his head. They all deserve to be punished for what they did to us. She's so close now, just around the next corner. Kill her for mommy. Jason would do as he was told. After all, he was his mommy's special boy. He moved around the bend in the tunnel arms raised to choke, squeeze, and tear. The fiery girl was there. She threw a bucket full of some steaming liquid into his face, and he felt long, dormant nerve endings sizzle into sluggish life as the toxic water burned his remaining eye and skin. He stumbled against the wall, stricken by more pain than he had felt in many shadowed years. He reached up as the girl sprinted by him back the way they had come. He gripped a hockey mask and wrenched it from his face, felt fresh air cooling his burning, decaying flesh. He turned and shambled after her, heard her voice as she roused her boyfriend. It would not matter. Jason would kill the both of them with his bare hands. He caught a glimpse of them as they rounded a bend ahead of them. They can't escape, Jason, his mother hissed in his ear, her voice heavy with unholy glee. They are within your grasp. Take them and show the boyfriend what his slut girl's insides look like. He clenched and unclenched his fingers, digits stronger than any man's in spite of their ragged condition. The exposed cords of sinew and bone. He charged beneath a naked light bulb that had begun to swing wildly on its thin cable. The ground trembled under his feet as if all hell was clawing its way through the concrete towards the world of lights above. He charged around the corner and saw them. They clung to the rusted iron rungs of a ladder embedded into the tunnel wall. Rennie was at the top, pushing frantically at a grate that opened onto the street. But the grate held fast. The boyfriend held on below her, his eyes wide with abject terror. It was an expression Jason knew better than his own reflection. The boy knew the score. There would be no flight through the city, no more dinners with family and friends, no future with his love. Their lives had dwindled down to the last flickers of a guttering flame. He knew that they would never leave the filthy chamber they were in. Jason reached out and gripped the boy's ankle. He felt the bones inside creak like brittle twigs. 
Jason prepared to pull him. The rumble beneath his feet had become a tumult. Jason paused as a strange, unfamiliar emotion filled him. Something was coming. He turned to look back down the tunnel and saw a solid wave of green water eclipsing each light as it sped towards him, pushing rancid wind before it. Mommy, he thought, I'm frightened. The water struck him then, wrenching his hand free of the boy's leg and carrying him away into liquid darkness. He felt his skin begin to burn as the water that wasn't water dissolved the last fibrous vestiges of his clothes. He felt his skin begin to melt and run like tallow, molding his broken body into even more grotesque shapes. He struck a wall, and then he was falling in a torrent of toxic waste into the open air. He caught a glimpse of the city lights, and then he was plunged into the murky depths of a river. Something bumped into his chest. He caught it and held it up. It was his hockey mask. The straps dissolved to nothingness. He jammed it into the melted, ravaged flesh of his face and held it until the soft tissue was fused around it, holding it in place. His feet sunk into the silt at the bottom, and he stood knee-deep in the muck, considering what he should do next. He could try to find the girl and her boyfriend, but who knew how long it would take or if it was even possible in such a huge place as this. Or he could just go home. There was something almost nostalgic about the gentle flow of the cold water around him. It made him dream of familiar places. He turned away from the faint hint of light that drifted through the river towards the silent, salty depths of the deep, dark sea. He knew which way to go as surely as a migrating bird knows which way to fly. Something called to him, and Jason followed. The pleasant orange glow of flickering flames colored the night darkened forest in shades of the setting sun. A pine knot exploded, sending sparks drifting across the clearing past the three men gathered around the fire. They clinked their bottles together and drank deeply, roaring with laughter. They were good friends reveling in each other's company. Okay, Josh LaRue said, turning the Crystal Lake Tigers baseball cap around backwards on his head. It's my turn. Give it to me, brother. Sean Campbell leaned over to confer quietly with Alex Vanover before nodding. Sean cleared his throat, confident that he would stump his friend. <clears throat> All right, here goes. What is the name of the antagonist of the Phantasm movie franchise? Said Sean. Josh snorted derisively. <laughs> That's too easy, man. He was called the long man. <laughs> Wrong-o. Laughed Sean. Yeah, man, Alex said. He asked what the bad guy from the movie was called. He didn't ask you what my nickname was. Josh raised one eyebrow. Who are you kidding? I know your wife. Your nickname should be The Small Man. Alex shrugged and took a sip of beer. Hey, I've never heard her complain. Happy wife, happy life. The correct answer is The Tall Man, Sean said. He is played by the great Angus Scrim. Awesome movie, Alex said. Surreal and trippy. Sean drained his bottle and tossed it into the plastic grocery bag beside him on the ground. My turn. Hit me with your best shot, as Pat Benatar would say. Okay, what is the name of the 1988 horror movie starring Bruce Campbell in the role of a New York police officer who is menaced by another officer who has seemingly come back from the dead? Josh asked. Easy. That would be Maniac Cop. Sean said. Correct. Bonus points if you can name the killer and the actor who played him. The killer was one Matt Cordell and he was played by Robert Zadar. Damn it, hissed Josh. You pulled into the lead. Sean mimed brushing dust off his shoulders. That's what I do. You two don't stand a chance. It's not over until the fat lady sings, Alex said, reaching into the cooler for a fresh beer. 
I'm up. Sean opened his mouth to speak and then paused as the sharp crack of a snapping branch rang out. The three men turned as one, looking in the direction of the lake a hundred yards distant. Silence spun out around them and then was broken by another crack, this one much closer. Hello? Josh called, leaning forward to peer into the dark. Is someone there? Silence, pregnant with menace, spread out around the campfire. No mosquito buzzed, no whippoorwill sang its night song. The forest was dead, and yet Josh felt unfriendly eyes upon him. He opened his mouth to speak again, and felt the rush of wind as something flew by his head. There was a meaty thunk, a butcher shop sound. Josh turned to see Alex trembling on numb legs, his skull transfixed by the rusty tines of an old pitchfork. <laughs> Gurgled Alex, fingers fumbling with the splintered shaft seemingly growing from his face. No. Josh took a step towards him, wanting to help, unsure how. Pain bloomed in his calf and Josh fell to the dirt, screaming in agony. He looked down and saw a small bone handle hunting knife protruding from his lower leg. His foot hung at an odd angle. The tendon severed. There was a rustle to his right, and Josh looked up at an abomination. A hideously deformed man had emerged from the trees, naked save for the battered hockey mask that seemed fused into his ravaged flesh and bulbous head. Strips of rotten, tumorous skin hung from the misshapen form, and his bones were visible in places. The man could not be alive. The fact that he drew labored breath was an affront to nature. Josh met the gaze of the monster's one baleful eye and felt his bowels turn to water. Oh, God! Oh, Jesus! That's Jason fucking Voorhees! Jason charged past Josh to meet Sean. A machete that he had pulled from the ground at the campsite clutched in his rotting hand. Sean raised a beer bottle over his head and brought it crashing down on Jason's head. Frothy suds flowed over the pitted yellow mask and down the melted chest. Sean thrust the jagged remains of the bottle out, meaning to cut the massive man's jugular. Jason caught Sean's arm and threw him to the ground beside Alex, who gave one final grunt and collapsed into the fire. Josh smelled cooking meat and gagged. No, man! Sean cried as he struggled against his murderer. Jason was impassive, unmoved by Sean's pleas. He gripped Sean's ankle and lifted him into the air upside down. Sean saw the gleam of moonlight on the machete poised to strike and screamed. Jason brought the blade down between Sean's splayed legs and buried it in his prostate. Blood flew in a crimson rain, splattered Josh's face with warm wetness. Jason wrenched the blade free and brought it down again and again, splintering Sean's pelvis and cutting into his abdomen. Steaming viscera spilled like writhing snakes from the horrid wound, and they fell like moist ropes over their owner's face. Whack! 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 Sean wasn't screaming anymore. Jason brought the machete down one final time, and Josh watched as his friend's body fell in two separate pieces. No! Josh moaned. He turned and began to crawl away from the fire and death. Leaves crackled beneath him as he went, too loud and far too slow. He would never make it. I'm gonna die. It can't be true. There's still so many things I want to do. A pair of cold hands clamped down around Josh's throat, cutting off his breath. Stars exploded before his eyes, great black depths yawning in the space between them. That darkness coveted his life. It had come for him in the shape of this monster that was squeezing the life from his body. It meant to have him. He had seconds left, less. The grip tightened and Josh felt his windpipe collapse. It sounded like a pine knot exploding in their fire. Pain receded then as the stars engulfed the world's light. He went limp and knew no more. Jason let the man drop to the ground and surveyed the scene around him. Mother was pleased. He lifted Josh's body and stripped the blue work shirt from him. He walked to the others, took the unburned pants from the one that had fallen in the fire and the boots from the separate halves of the third. He dressed quickly and then slipped the bloody machete in the waistband of his new pants. He glanced up as a cloud covered the skull-faced moon, 
a fitting witness to the night's work. Mommy is so proud of you, Jason. Content, he strode off into the dark forest. Jason was home at last. Chapter 1 Cabin by the Lake A gentle fog rolled along the gravel country road in slow, roiling waves, setting the scene with an autumnal Halloween atmosphere. The doe crept from the trees like a ghost, her white tail twitching, her every nerve singing. The world around her held danger, especially in that place where the unnatural walked the floor of the living forest. She took tentative steps forward into the ditch and began to graze on the sweet grasses that grew on the side of the road. She was young, and therefore she fed alone. Next year, if fate smiled upon her and kept her safe from the hunter's sight, she might feed with her yearling. A soft, familiar sound reached her ears and her muscles tensed. Two lights appeared around the bend in the road, glowing like the burning eyes of a monstrous owl swooping down over the ground. The doe froze with sweet, half-chewed grass on her tongue. Fear bloomed, beckoned by the half-remembered vision of her mother being struck by a truck before her very eyes. Caution and prudence won the day. The doe bolted for the forest, leaving a small pile of steaming dung on top of a rotten wooden sign that lay forgotten on the roadside. The words Camp Forest Green written in faded letters on it. The car passed by, its driver unaware of the doe's flight. Her name was Elizabeth Marcus and she had other things on her mind. Hers was a beautiful face, her auburn hair long beneath the blue and red baseball cap, her eyes the brilliant green of emeralds. She looked left and right, searching for her turn. She rounded a bend and slowed as she spotted a break in the trees to her right. A small hand-painted sign read Adam's Place, with an arrow pointing down a deeply rutted dirt road. She turned on her blinker and turned the canopy of trees immediately blotting out the sky overhead like sinister grasping fingers. The cabin came into view a minute later. It was two stories, made of cedar logs, its black windows unfriendly staring eyes. She turned off the ignition and sat for a moment, listening to the click of the coaling engine. Hesitant to step from the Toyota's false sense of safety, she thought the place might be very nice in the warm light of day. Now it seemed full of sinister intent. She took a deep breath to calm her nerves and got out. Elizabeth grabbed a duffel bag from the car's trunk and strode up the rickety front steps to the door. She put the key in the lock, turned it, and forced the door open. It scraped along on loose hinges, deepening an already impressive gouge in the battered wooden floor. Musty air rushed out to greet her. She paused on the threshold, feeling a crushing sense of loneliness. This place felt lifeless, long abandoned. She reached around the door jamb and flipped the light switch. The single bulb hanging on a cable from the living room's vaulted ceiling flared into life and then died with a pop, leaving the space shrouded in oppressive darkness. Shit, she muttered, slamming her bag to the porch. She walked around the corner of the house and down the side towards the backyard, picking her way carefully around overgrown rose bushes that would appear a riot of color in the day. A shape loomed in the night. A clapboard tool shed nestled against the tree line. She opened the door and stepped inside, nearly screaming as something thin and wispy brushed her forehead. A spider web? She hated fucking spiders. She reached out with a trembling hand and grasped the offending object. She yanked and light flooded the small shed. It's the pull cord for the light, dipshit, she thought as she stepped inside and began to rummage around. You thought it was a spider web? You're jumping at shadows. Maybe I am, she whispered, but anyone would be in my shoes. She picked up a box of light bulbs from a dusty shelf in one corner and then hefted a ten-foot ladder under her arm. The shed door slammed shut behind her. Panic and recrimination washed over her as she realized she was trapped in a small building with only one way in or out. It was a major tactical disadvantage, a mistake only a rookie should make. She was not that. 
Elizabeth charged forward and rammed her shoulder into the door, expecting resistance. There was none, and she nearly fell on her face as the door swung easily open and struck the shed wall. She glanced around quickly, searching for any sign of danger and saw nothing. The wind blew briskly across her skin, chilling her. Could it really have been the wind that slammed the door? She wasn't sure. The one thing she was sure of was that standing there being indecisive was a great way to end up dead in Crystal Lake. She jogged back to the front of the cabin and set up the ladder inside. Twenty seconds later, the living room was filled with warm yellow light. Satisfied, Elizabeth placed the collapsed ladder on the front porch and carried her duffel bag inside. She locked the door and then climbed the staircase to the second floor landing, turning right to the largest bathroom. She flicked the light on and tossed the bag on the bed. A sound, something scraping on the side of the cabin. She paused in the act of unpacking. Was there a tree limb close enough to the cabin to scratch the logs? She couldn't remember. A chill that had nothing to do with the temperature in the room ran down her spine. A small part of her began to scream, wailing for her to run from the place before it was too late. Elizabeth gritted her teeth and pushed the crying thing back down into the depths of her soul, where its weakness could not hold her back. She had asked to be there. She had volunteered. This one night would make her career. All she had to do was keep her head both figuratively and physically attached to her body until the sun came up. Simple as can be, right, Liz? As easy as taking a moonlit stroll through a minefield wearing uh, oversized snowshoes. A board creaked as the old cabin settled in the breeze. She placed a palm between her breast and felt her heart beating like a fluttering bird beneath her ribs. She tried to grin and failed. You can say one thing for sure, girl. You've never felt more alive than you feel right now. She grabbed a long white t-shirt and a fresh pair of underwear from the dresser and walked to the bathroom. It was small and dusty with brown rust stains in the sink and antique clawfoot tub. She put her clothes on the closed toilet seat and leaned over to turn the shower on. Dark brown water burst out, splattering the wall and shower curtain. She turned back and took the baseball cap off, letting her long hair fall down her back like velvety flames. She undressed in front of the mirror, mounted over the sink, and studied her trim body. It was definitely the body of an athlete, and yet exquisitely feminine. Some people looked down on her for her looks, said that she would never amount to anything more than eye candy. They would never give her credit for any advancement she made, any promotion. In their minds, she earned everything she got on her back or under the supervisor's desk. The fact she could run circles around most men and beat them black and blue in a fight didn't matter to them. She would show them all. They would all see her in a different light after tonight. Another sound outside, and suddenly the cabin was plunged into darkness once again. A second passed, and then something crashed downstairs, shaking the house. The panic monster raised its head again, and it was much harder to ignore it this time. She reached behind her to turn the shower off and then wrapped a towel around herself. She crept out onto the landing and looked over the railing to the ground floor. The front door was open, hanging from one hinge. The wood by the knob shattered. Dry, dead leaves tumbled across the threshold, borne on the wind. Elizabeth looked around for any sign of movement and saw nothing. She turned towards the stairs, walking as lightly as she could. Any sound she made might spell her doom. The cabin around her no longer felt lifeless, no longer felt abandoned. Something that meant her harm moved among the shadows, watched her with hate-filled eyes. She reached the top of the stairs and peered down, willing her eyes to penetrate the dark. Something huge moved behind her. Oh, God, no! Elizabeth spun on the spot, her arms raised to defend herself, and there he was. He was like a living tumor, every inch of exposed flesh corrupted by time and violence. She stared for a frozen moment at the ruined hockey mask that was melted into his very flesh, stared into his single baleful eye. Jason Voorhees swung his machete down at her with all his might, a stroke intended to cleave her in two. It was only her reflexes honed by years, by training, that prevented that. She jumped back felt searing pain across her abdomen, and then she was falling through the balcony rail and crashing to the living room floor 12 feet below. She struck on her side and rolled to her feet, 
Breathing was agony. Two of her ribs were broken. She quickly glanced down at her body, saw a thin line of blood oozing beneath her slashed towel. She would live, but only if she moved. She looked up and saw him coming for her down the stairs. Eat me, you asshole, she cried, spinning and sprinting out the shattered cabin door. Each step sent glass slivers slicing through her chest. The pain was unbelievable, unbearable. She heard his heavy tread on the cabin's porch as he followed behind. She reached the trees and pushed through low-hanging branches, feeling fresh pain as twigs dug furrows into her exposed upper chest and face. How far was she supposed to run? Her mind was a blank. The plan was a vapor. She only knew which way to run. She pushed ahead, felt her foot catch on a fallen limb and fell. The breath was knocked from her and black stars bloomed before her eyes. You've got to be kidding, she thought as she struggled to her feet. I'm running through the woods basically naked and I trip and fall? What kind of trashy horror movie did I fall into? She ran on, her body a road map of hurts. She saw light ahead where the foliage thinned. She was almost there. She charged forward into a clearing and stopped in the center, turning to face her pursuer. He wasn't there. Nothing moved in the night. Everything was silence. Had he given up? The softest whisper behind her. Elizabeth spun around and stared up at the monster that intended to kill her. He was a mountain eclipsing the stars. He raised the machete and then stopped as floodlights burst into life all around them. Jason looked about them, confused, and then turned back to finish Elizabeth. But he was too late. He caught a last fleeting glimpse of her disappearing beyond the lights, and then the air was full of buzzing, biting bullets. They tore into his chest, his limbs, his head. We got him! Someone screamed as uniformed FBI agents emerged from the forest, their guns spitting molten death. How many rounds hit the monster? Fifty? A hundred? Surely he must fall. The fusillade faltered as Jason withstood the onslaught. Men looked at each other, bravado giving way to uneasy fear. This was not possible. Jason tightened his grip on his weapon and took a step forward, ready to mete out doom to each and every person who dared to intrude on his land. There was a thump, and then a mortar shell exploded at Jason's feet. He loosed a scream and came apart, his arms, legs, and head separating from his body. The pieces rained down in a shower of black blood as the agents cheered. FBI agent Elizabeth Marcus stepped from the trees, a jacket draped over her shoulders. Everything seemed to hurt, and yet she found her smile. It was finished. She was alive, and her co-workers and supervising agents were all clapping her on the back. Supervisory Special Agent Abernathy, the lead of the operation, wrapped her in a brief but fierce hug and whispered in her ear, You gave me a hell of a scare there. That was a little too close for comfort. Great job, Marcus. Thank you, sir, she said. Abernathy released her and waved a hand in the air. All right, let's get this shit cleaned up. Agents began to move about their work, bagging and tagging, cataloging everything. Only one person saw Jason's black heart laying on the leaf-strewn ground, continuing to beat. Creighton Duke knelt under a low-hanging branch fifty feet from the clearing, invisible in the dark. He looked like a Wild West gunslinger, born a hundred years too late, dressed in his cowboy boots, jeans, and a long duster coat. He scratched his beard thoughtfully as the heart beats one last time and then stilled. He smiled and shook his head as a young agent picked it up with trembling hands and placed it gingerly into an evidence bag. Look at them, Duke thought. They actually think Jason is dead. The image of an old book written in a long-forgotten antiquarian age floated into his mind, and Duke shook his head before turning away. He made his way through the forest to a dirt road where he'd parked his old Bronco and climbed behind the wheel. He needed to come up with a plan. He needed to be ready because the story was far from over.
Chapter 2. You are what you eat. Medical examiner Philip Hunt pushed a gurney down an antiseptic white hallway, the color of his lab coat. He turned a corner, walking by a placard mounted on the wall, the words, Youngston Federal Morgue, emblazoned on it in block letters. He passed by two young women dressed in similar coats who turned to stare at the sealed black body bag on the cart. Is that him? One of them whispered. Yeah. Hunt drew near two uniformed FBI agents sitting at a table outside a double set of doors at the end of the hall and handed his ID card to one while the other Pat searched him. All clear, the second agent said. They logged Hunt's entry on their clipboard and motioned him on. The morgue was cold, its steel counters and surfaces gleaming in the low light. Hot pushed the gurney over beside one of the autopsy tables and transferred the body bag to it. He uncovered the tools on the cart beside him and then toggled a switch on the side of a small microphone that dangled on a cable above the space. Here we go, he thought as he unzipped the bag and flinched at the scent of burnt gunpowder, rot, and coppery blood. He took a deep breath and began to speak into the mic, his deep voice resonant in the space. The subject's name is Jason Voorhees. This tape is strictly for internal distribution only. Anyone listening must have C4 level clearance or higher. If not, you're in a heap of trouble. He laughed, turning to the table and taking his first good look at the remains. Jesus, he said. You're a mess, my friend, and no mistake. We have a large male Caucasian with massive tissue loss due to extreme explosive trauma. Wait, I'd say 230, maybe 240. The subject has third degree burns to over 65% of the anterior torso, first and second over the posterior torso. In addition to explosive trauma, the subject is a victim of multiple bullet wounds. At a glance, I'd say we are looking at well over a hundred bullet wounds of varying caliber. It's going to be a joy to count. He turned from the table and pulled a soft drink from under a counter and popped the top, slurping loudly. He belched and then turned back to pick up Jason's masked head from the table. He stared into the glazed, lifeless eye, wondering if he should feel fear. This was the head of one of the most prolific serial killers in recorded history. He felt nothing. Hunt leaned closer to the mic and cleared his throat. <clears throat> it is my personal opinion that this guy is deader than shit. He put the head back down and picked up Jason's black heart. Um, please strike that last comment from the record. There is evidence upon examination of pulmonary edema. The heart appears to be twice the size of a normal heart and is malformed. I note fatty deposits on the left and right atria. It appears to be filled with a black viscous fluid. I don't know what it is, but it's not blood. He moved to drop the organ into a skull and froze. The heart seemed to grow heavier in his hands. Its cold flesh grew warm and then hot. He felt it flex as it began to beat. A chorus of voices spoke in his head, growing louder as his own voice grew small and then silent. An irrepressible need flooded his chest, and the last vestiges of his conscious will screamed in horror and revulsion at the knowledge of what he was about to do. Join us, chanted the chorus in his head. Join us. Haunt raised the heart to his lips and began to eat like a ravenous wolf his jowls glistening with dark bile. He chewed, swallowed, and bit again, a savage, animalistic growl rumbling deep in his chest. Suddenly, orange globules of light shot from Jason's ragged torso and flew into Hunt's body, filling him with a vile presence. He wanted to scream, to cry as the last of his control was stolen from him, but he was denied that. The lights grew dim, and the last thing he heard was the soft laughter of a small boy.
Coroner's assistant, Eric Pope, strode up the passage towards the FBI checkpoint, whistling the latest Madonna tune. He lifted his hand that was not laden with his enhanced Chinese takeout and pushed his Coke bottle glasses further up his nose. He smiled at the two gruff soldier types seated behind the table and gave them a companionable nod. They did not return it. ID card, please, said the larger of the two men as the other moved to search Eric. You just saw me come out of there like five minutes ago. ID, said the smaller agent as he ran his hand up Eric's inner thigh and brushed the bottom of his testicles. Eric jumped, unable to suppress a small giggle at the awkward touch and produced his identification. The agents notated him on their log and passed him along through the doors. Eric had to fight the urge to spin around and give the men the finger. Those macho bastards get off on this shit he thought as he walked to the morgue entrance and opened the door. I bet he grabbed my sack on purpose. Haunt was bent over the autopsy table when Eric entered. Eric hardly spared him a glance on his way to set their food down on an empty metal table near the wall. If he had, he might have noticed the gore smeared across his co-worker's mouth and cheeks. Can you believe the nerve of those two gorillas out there? Eric asked, sitting down on a stool beside the table. I'm half considering going back out there and demanding he buy me dinner after the groping he put me through. Haunt turned his back to Eric and started rummaging through the autopsy tools arranged on the table. Eric frowned. It wasn't like Haunt to sit in silence and not engage in the celebrated pastime of verbally bashing the roughnecks. He shrugged and rolled his stool closer to Jason's remains, an idea forming in his mind of how to get a rise out of his partner. You know, Phil, he said, this is actually an amazing opportunity. I mean, how many people get a chance to say whatever they want to Jason fucking Voorhees? Hey, you moldy fuck! How you doing, you fat ass? Blown up maggoty fuck! Behind him, Phil picked up a bone saw, considered it, and put it back down. Eric shot Jason the finger. Suck this! You know what I'd like to do to you? I'd like to take a crap right on your fucking mask. A big old mango-sized crap. A hand fell on the back of Eric's neck, and he looked up to see a double-pronged foot-long probe an inch from his face. He glanced past it into the menacing eyes of Phil and felt his heart skip a beat. Something was very wrong. Those were not Phil's eyes staring back at him. Those were the eyes of a stranger. Y yes, he said. That that's a probe. Haunt flexed his arm, amazingly strong, and lifted Eric from the stool with one hand. Eric scratched at his wrist, trying to free himself, but it was no use. Haunt's grip was iron. Well, what the hell are you doing? he shouted. Phil, stop! Haunt slammed Eric down face first onto the foot of the table, pushing his face deep into the grid of the drain. Metal sliced deep into his flesh. Eric tried to scream again and was silenced by the probe as it thrust through the back of his skull, pushing his face even further into the grid. Haunt pulled the probe free and let Eric fall to the ground, his face peeling free from the drain like grated cheese. Haunt stared down at his handiwork for a moment, and then he walked out of the morgue. He paused as he caught his reflection in the stainless steel cooler's doors. Jason Voorhees stared back. Haunt turned from the doors and stalked up the hall, out past the FBI checkpoint. Hey, Doc, said the smaller of the two agents from behind his table. Sorry about the mess we left you. We really nailed that guy. Yeah, the bigger man laughed, punching his partner in the shoulder. Jason was nothing but a big pussy anyway. Haunt stopped in his tracks, a growl erupting from his throat as he turned back to the two men. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue in chapters 1 and 2 of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. I loved what Jeremy did with Child's Play 1, and I'm loving what he's doing with Jason Goes to Hell. Now, in all fairness, he did kill me, 
Sean Campbell and Alex Vanover, and we are the members of the Slash Tracks Network channel, so, but I'll put that aside, you know, he, he did have Jason murder us, but it was kind of cool to be a part of the story, so thanks, Jeremy, that was really neat. Also, thank you, Sean Campbell, for voicing yourself, and when the unabridged version comes out, Alex will be voicing himself as well. Uh, also, uh, we did a drawing a couple months ago, and the winner was Rashad Moore. He is going to be killed off at some point in this book, so congratulations, uh, Rashad, on that. I hope you enjoy uh, how you get unalived by Jason later on. Uh, I don't even know how it's going to go down yet. That being said, uh, I did enjoy how Jeremy tied Part 8 into Part 9. Me and him actually spoke, and I had a few story ideas, and apparently he ran with some of them. Uh, one of which was uh, how the toxic waste didn't really turn Jason into a small boy. That was just the girl seeing a hallucination in Part 8, uh, that he, Jason would have actually been washed away uh, in the toxic sludge. It would have eaten his clothes away. And he may have found his melted mask and stuck it to his face. And I always thought that that is why he looked so bulbous and different in uh, Jason Goes to Hell. Because of the damage from the toxic sludge. And that's why his mask is all melted and like fused to his face in that movie. So Jeremy took that idea and actually made that part of the story. And uh, a step further... Uh, the reason Jason's clothes look different is because he had his clothes eaten by all that toxic waste, and then he stole the clothes off of me, Sean, and Alex's dead bodies. So that's kind of cool, too, to be part of that iconic Jason Goes to Hell look. Uh, that being said, I really enjoyed these chapters. Uh, I enjoyed getting that tie-up from Part 8. And, uh... You know, the whole scene with Jason in the cabin uh, going after the FBI agent, I love that we got a deeper dive into her mind, into her character. Um, I'm curious to see what he does with Creighton Duke. A lot of people have mentioned that there's some backstory that wasn't used where Creighton Duke's girlfriend had been killed by Jason, and that's what set uh, Creighton off on his journey. I really hope, uh, as, you, as some of you have said, I really hope that uh, Jeremy takes that story and adds it into this one. I would love some more backstory on Creighton Duke. I would like to know what a hot dog and a donut, what that came from, the whole breaking the pinky thing, so many things uh, that Jeremy can do with this story, and I really hope he does. Adam Marcus, uh, the writer and director of Jason Goes to Hell, is very excited for this fan novelization. And Adam, if you're listening, thank you so much for being cool with it and giving it your blessing. And uh, if anybody listening hasn't done so already, check out uh, Getting Sidetracked Episode 2 here on the channel, where Alex Vanover and I actually spoke for three hours with Adam Marcus. It was a, an amazing interview, and I learned a lot, uh, not only about Jason Goes to Hell, but about Adam's career and other movies he's worked on. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's narration. I'm excited to bring more of these chapters to you as soon as Jeremy has them available. And as he does release chapters, if you're a patron or want to join the Patreon, you'll have access to the chapters in ebook form uh, before the narrations even hit the channel. Uh, chapters uh, 1 and 2 in the prologue are available in ebook form on Patreon exclusively right now. I was a little confused about the name of the coroner. Uh, there was a couple inconsistencies there, not a big deal, um, but it, it read Haunt and then Gaunt. Um, so I just went with Haunt. Uh, I know Jeremy's going to take some creative liberties. That's perfectly fine with me. Nobody wants a direct novelization of a movie. The, the funnest part about these novelizations are the little side journeys we can go on, the little deep dives we can take into the characters. Uh, like, um, for instance, it's going to be interesting to find out why Jason tied a guy down naked and shaved him, or... Uh, how Jason was able to access that one deputy's mind and talk with his voice. Um, so yeah, this is going to be exciting. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to this uh, novelization. Uh, out of all the books I've read in a while, this one has me the most intrigued. Jason Goes to Hell is a very divisive film, one that I actually love as well as Jason X. I love. There are a couple of they're in my top five. 
uh, Jason movies of all time. So is part five. And this is a very unpopular opinion, but in fact, my top three favorite Jason films are Jason X, Jason Goes to Hell, and A New Beginning. Okay, after that, my list is probably a lot like most people's, but uh, there's a reason why those three are my favorite. And that's because they're original, they took chances, they took us out of Crystal Lake, at least out of the whole campsite thing, and gave us, uh, you know, a little something new to chew on. So, um, I hope you enjoyed it and you're excited for what comes next. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel, click the like button, drop me a comment. I love to hear from each and every one of you and discuss these books with you. Also, click the bell so you'll always know when new chapters are dropping. Please consider helping the channel through Patreon, PayPal, Cameo, or Cash App. All the information to help out through any of those is in the description and pinned comment. We can't monetize the channel on YouTube, so that's the only way to fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. See you next time.